All right. It looks like we are live. Just double checking. Wonderful. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, those on Zoom and in the greater internet world. My name is Nebra Nelson. I am the Director of Arts Engagement at Seattle Rep. I'll give a quick physical description of myself for blind and low vision audience members. I'm a lighter skinned brown woman with short brown hair, wearing a multicolored shirt, and on the white wall behind me are some black and white photos. Uh, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we're on tr the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, including the Duwamish people past and present, and we honor with gratitude this land and the Duwamish tribe. Uh, we continue to uh, work on creating relationships with our local communities, uh, and you can learn more about that and how to support local tribes here in Seattle uh, on the Seattle Rep website. So I'd love to just jump in and get started. Um, uh, let's get started with just each of you introducing yourselves. You do so much both um, in the theater uh, as artists, but also as activists outside of theater. And I'd love for you to share a little bit about what you do and who you are. Uh, and I'll just pass it to each of you. Uh, Fatima, will you start, start us off? Yeah. Of course. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Fatima Wardak. I am an Afghan American, uh, first generation in my family. My parents immigrated here uh, in the late 80s. Um, I'm currently in Brooklyn, New York. This is where I live, but I was born and raised in Seattle. I'm an actor, an artist, um, collaborator, do a lot of like devised and original work, um, and also lots of fun plays. Um, and Activist wise, I try to be a very like supportive community member um, and supportive of other communities that have been supportive of me. Uh, and in the most recent present became an immigration expert um, in assisting people uh, evacuating Afghanistan. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Humaira. Humaira, you're unmuted, and you can stay. You can stay unmuted. Thank you. Um, I'm Humaira Gilzai. I'm an Afghan American. My family immigrated to the United States uh, after the Russian invasion. Um, we came and settled in the Bay Area in 1980. I'm currently on the land of Ramatushaloni, colonially known as San Francisco. Um, my work is mainly as a cultural producer, uh, speaker, and writer. Uh, as far as my work as a cultural producer uh, goes, I basically um, have had the amazing opportunity to work at Seattle Rep and a lot of uh, other theaters uh, that were developing uh, productions that were related to Afghanistan. And I brought uh, cultural authenticity to their work by working with the playwrights and uh, directors, actors, and many, many components uh, of a production. I also have done cultural advisory with film and television as well. Uh, as a writer, I write a blog called Afghan Culture Unveiled, and I write about Afghan food, culture, and most recently, all, about, all I write about is uh, Afghan politics. Um, and I speak about Afghanistan, Afghan women, um, the history of Afghanistan, and the current situation uh, that is uh, ongoing. And thank you so much for having me today. Thank you for being here. Sylvia. Hi, um, my name is Sylvia Corey. I'm a playwright, recently a physician also. Um, my play, Selling Cobble, will be in Seattle Rep's upcoming season. Um, I wanna say first and foremost, how honored I am to be on a panel with uh, two, hopefully three, um, Afghan women artists and activists as an outsider. Um, I am of Turkish, Lebanese, Iraqi, and North African descent. Um, and the impetus for my play, Selling Kabul, which is the story of an Afghan SIV applicant uh, in an interpreter um, who was left behind by the Americans. The impetus for that was pro bono work that my husband was actually doing with his colleagues starting in 2015. Um, and they were doing that for the International Refugee Assistance Project or IRAP, um, which is basically lawyers 
trying to use legal uh, recourse to help people get to the United States. So I was shocked um, both as an American and as someone with, let's say a family whose tragedies and histories have been shaped by negligent colonial forces that such promises had been made and then broken. That was appalling. Um, and I've been immensely fortunate to have had the privilege of speaking with a number of such interpreters and their families to guide my work on this play over the past seven years. That's really tragic to me, the state that we're in now, um, when that, you know, seven years is a long time and the history of our country's involvement in Afghanistan is just... So I have an upcoming production of this play at Playwrights Horizons in New York City. Um, this November and December, and I will be fundraising parallel to the production for IRAP, um, seeing as my entry point really was these legal recourses. Um, I'm very interested in this organization that's working to make good on these promises um, through, a legal, through legal means. Um, I'm also in the midst of inviting many voices, particularly Afghan voices, to the conversation sparked by the play. In a lot of ways, I think my play is actually very American because it's really dealing with American culpability. Um, and I'm really eager after this panel to connect with and amplify the voices and efforts of the Afghan women here. And thank, thank you for having me and for including me. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing a bit about that, um, about the history with your play. It really it leads really nicely into the conversation. But before we uh, continue, I just wanted to also say that we have one other uh, panelist, Gazelle, who is uh, without power currently. Uh, so we're really hoping that she'll be able to jump on as we continue this conversation. Um, but want to make sure that y'all look into her regardless of whether she's able to join us or not. Um, so as you kind of uh, started us off, Sylvia, uh, a lot of what we're here to talk about, uh, in addition to uh, your activism and your advocacy um, outside of your art, is how that art and activism can be connected. And obviously there are the, I love that you set up this, this ability to, to, for art to highlight a platform for um, su greater support um for either monetary or in other in other ways uh for an audience to better understand an issue and then connect them to resources um but i'm wondering uh what are other ways that y'all see art to as a tool for advocacy either um a piece of art itself or the work that you each do around productions um what do you see as the importance of that and where have you where are you seeing that um uh, perhaps connected to some of the the work that you are doing right now in regards to Afghanistan and uh, your art in that in that regard. Anyone can jump in. I, yeah, I can, go ahead. I, I'll jump in. Um, well, as my work goes as far as the cultural advocacy work that I do is all about bringing uh, Afghan culture in the forefront of any production that involves Afghanistan. Um, so um, what I do as part of my work is to bring in the local community as well as, you know, making sure that whatever is in the script and, and the casting and all that um, is uh, reflects the Afghan culture. Um, and one of the challenges I've had is that there aren't that many um, Afghan actors that are trained to be in theater, um, present company uh, not included. Um, so it's very uh, often I find that non-Afghans are cast in roles. And what happens is that the research that's done is very um, much what is just available online, which isn't extensively, it doesn't go into the nuances of the culture and the history and why the Afghans do what they do. And it's we're not a monolithic culture. So uh, an Afghan who lived in Afghanistan in the 70s in Kabul is going to behave and, and talk in very different way than an Afghan who lives in Kabul 
today in let's say Herat. So those are the kinds of things that I feel that I have been doing this type of advocacy work for a long time. Um, but as far as the past few weeks is concerned, um, you know, along with the video that I created a hundred year history of Afghan women five months ago, anticipating that this is going to happen because the U.S. was directly negotiating with the Taliban, excluding the Afghan government and Afghan women and Afghan people. Um, so this was bound to ha be an explosive situation when you go and, and make a deal with the enemy of a country and then you expect them to work together, uh, that's not going to work. Um, so that video was meant to really um, help people understand the history of Afghan women that it was not always the Taliban, it was not always the US occupation, but there are many, many stories um, that goes with the Afghan women's history. Um, but for myself, as far as my work is concerned, a lot of my artists through writing, and I really um, saw the power of storytelling in the past two weeks. I wrote about the um, director of our schools. I'm also co-founder of Afghan Friends Network, a nonprofit that I started uh, 18 years ago. We've been educating women and girls in, in a remote province of Afghanistan. And we had to get the director of our school out, and she was able to get out, but without her family. And I wrote her story with a call for um, donations so we can assist in getting her six uh, children and her husband out of Afghanistan. And um, it's been incredible. In two weeks, we've been able to raise $40,000. My goal is 57. I'm very comfortable we will reach it. Hopefully, people will go on my blog, Afghan Culture Unveiled, and read the story um, of this woman that's uh, been so brave. She does not work with that, uh, with the U.S. government. She does will does not qualify for an SIV, um, but she has done so much to help Afghan girls and women, and basically um, work side to side with the U.S. mission in promoting women's rights. And she's basically one of the people that would have been collateral damage if we were not able to help her. So I feel like strong storytelling um, has been my way of advocacy, as well as I started a social media campaign called Action for Afghans. Um, and every day, um, for one week, we posted um, a social media post uh, letting people know what is going on in Afghanistan is both an education as well as a call to action. And now we do it three times a week. And it's really meant to highlight the uh, corrupt system of uh, war that feeds the U.S. economy and how that actually affects human lives. These are 40 million Afghans we're talking about as well as the U.S. veterans who have lost brothers, sisters, um, and aid workers. All of those lives uh, were lost for, for what? Uh, we don't know. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. Um, I'd love to hear from Fatima, from, especially for you're an actor and a writer, and um, you know, Sylvia shared a bit from a writer's point of view how you know, telling that story, elevating that story uh, can be a really clear way of advocacy. And I wonder, as an Afghan American actor, uh, how have you found uh, that you've brought your identity and your advocacy into your work? Um, and maybe that also connects to your writing as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, and thank you, Homaira, for that was all really wonderful to hear, helpful information as well. Um, yeah, you know, Unfortunately, as an actor, I, I struggle to figure out how to bring forth like my identity or really um, like amplify the story of Afghan people. Um, a Thousand Splendid Sons at the, at the Rep was an incredible start for me. Um, I was really grateful to be a part of that production. I never thought that I would, as an actor, get an opportunity to play my own ethnicity. So that was huge. And then coming across Selling Cobble, which I'm so excited to see, um, was another really exciting um, 
exciting thing for me to see as an Afghan actor that our stories are being heard, they're being told, people want to hear them and people are taking the time to write them and produce them. Um, so I've actually been focusing a lot on writing as well because you know, <laughs> it's it always happens when I start like looking for monologues or, you know, start looking for a new place to read. And I'm like, why isn't anybody writing something that I could be in or that, you know, somebody who looks like me and shares my identity could be in? And then I just thought like, well, why don't I just try to write it myself? So I've been working on a couple different projects, but the one I'm pretty excited about most recently is um, I started writing what I envisioned to be a TV show, um, but who knows where it'll go. That's how I'm writing it right now. Um, about like my family's experience being Afghan Americans, because I'm really interested in Afghan stories that aren't from like the colonial perspective or not from the perspective of a US veteran or an American person. I want to see an Afghan family deal with growing up in America because that was a huge struggle for my family and it was a hilarious struggle. I mean, when you think about it, like the the story of an immigrant, like it, it can it's it can be very tragic and sad and full of a lot of heartache, but it's also kind of a hilarious conundrum that you just appear in this land you had no intention of coming to, but for whatever reason you find yourself here and now you're raising your children and they're going to grow up in this other world that you're figuring out. So, you know, I there's all kinds of um, scenes that just bring me so much joy that I think would be really interesting for an American audience to see. Um, and one of the things that I feel like I'm working on highlighting the most in, in this project and in other projects is Afghan women. Um, because as an Afghan woman, um, other Afghan women are very near and dear to my heart. And it just, it saddens me that all the imagery we see of Afghan women is just, is depressing. And, and those, those are certainly true stories that are happening. But my, my experience with Afghan women, my memories growing up is my mom and my aunts um, sitting around drinking tea, laughing hysterically, playing Daria drums and singing old songs. And I, I just love that. And I want to see that on a stage or on a screen. I want to see these women experiencing joy the way that I saw them, like despite everything they went through, they still got together every Friday night while all of their husbands went and played volleyball at the community center and drank tea and just laughed. And I, I would just really love for anybody to put that on stage or on screen. And so that's something I'm working towards. Um, and, you know, it's, also like something that I would like to act in, should it ever get produced or should I ever get to like shoot a web series or something. Um, so that's kind of what I'm working towards, but connecting with people like Humaira, who I was lucky to meet during A Thousand Splendid Sons, and now with Sylvia, who's, I'm just so thrilled that she's interested in our people and telling our stories and connected to it. Um, as a non-Afghan, this is just really exciting for me as a young artist. May I jump in there for a minute? Fatima, I just want to let you know that um, a play I've written just got residency at Golden Thread Productions. It has four Afghan character, female characters. You got my I, number, girl. So you I, wish, <laughs> I wish you were in the Bay Area because we're, we're doing a workshop in uh, October. But Ooh, if there are that's... Afghan actor actresses that are watching this, please let me know because I would love to cast Afghans in, in these four roles. And it is it is that story that you're talking about of Afghan Americans. And they're, um, these four women are going on a pilgrimage to Mecca. So it's a, a story, it's a fun story, lots of humor and, um, you know, secrets, family secrets and, and lots of uh, connections. So. I'm hoping at some point it'll be produced in New York and we can cast you. Well, my sister lives in the Bay Area, so, you know, it's just a flight away. <laughs> we'll talk. Yeah, 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 please. Okay, let me know. Is there a public presentation, Humara, or is it a workshop? Uh, it's a workshop. Uh, we will do a presentation at the end of um, the workshop, but it will not be public. Um, it'll be invite only just because of COVID restrictions and such. So, yeah. But Fatima John, right, contact me. <laughs> On it.
Thank you. This is so lovely. I love that this is happening right before our eyes. Women supporting women. Yes. <laughs> um i we will be looking for a public presentation of that and uh for your play as well fatima and you you brought up uh, you've been everyone's been sharing so much so much that i want to dig into um uh the the question issue of representation is something i think about a lot um, as well as a, a middle eastern woman um an artist uh myself um, and the and as you said, Humaira, that there's so much specificity across the Middle East and North Africa and South Asia um, within each of our cultures, within each of our our countries. Even there, there's so many different ethnicities. There's so many different experiences, um, and there's also that balance of of sharing. You know, um, all the crucial conversations and histories that are happening in our in our countries. Um, but also sharing the joy and the individual and more personal experiences. Um, and uh, and I love that you're you, you've kind of identified that we we see so many narratives about um, uh, so many dark, uh, dramatic narratives, especially about Middle Eastern women um, uh, and especially about Afghanistan as well. Um, and uh, I would love to hear from Sylvia, you know, in making this 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 place, Al Kabul, um, what your process was in uh, grappling with that representation and perhaps how advocacy might have been a part of that writing process because you were drawing from this ex your husband's experience working directly with uh, immigrants and refugees. Um, how was advocacy actually perhaps a part of that, that, that writing process um, and and how did you approach that question of representation in this particular very specific story? Yeah, so for me, um, the issue of representation is a is a big one, and I kind of recognized that I had a platform, and I recognized that there was a real injustice being done for a really long time that no one knew about, and that was kind of the impetus for this. This was really that after someone would see a reading of my play, they would go, this is happening. And that was really shocking to me. So I think that was the intention behind it. And then moving forward through casting and these conversations, there's really not an easy answer. I will say, I don't think that American theater, I think we have learned a lot of the limitations of American theater in recent years, a lot of limitations of America. Um, but I'll say there's a lot of... Um, institutional questions that get posed. And um, yeah, I don't think there's an easy answer to this. I think I will say that having tried very hard to cast Afghan actors in these parts, it's been difficult. And I think if I had known the extent to which Myra can get it, I, I honestly didn't know the extent to which um, you are available to help on that level. Like if I had known that a bit earlier, which I probably could have, but I was very deep in um, COVID in the hospital, if I'm honest, that's what was actually happening. Um, but I think that efforts like that are very important. And like for the production at Seattle Rep, that would be something that would be really interesting to me is like, how can we more actively engage in this? Because I actually think that casting, especially now with our restrictions on everything, is very difficult. And then also trying to say, no, we need Afghan actors that have these specific qualifications and these specific credits until you start casting you can't you'll never have those people at that level so it's a very frustrating conversation and one that i think we're a bit stuck i think um people like kumaira are invaluable and honestly i wish that i had just been more educated about that even like a year ago it's such an ongoing process, and that's also where I know that um, you know so many people are talking about coalition building right now. The there's the newly formed Minatma, Middle Eastern North African Theater Makers Alliance. I believe it's Alliance um, that I know folks here know about or are part of. Um, and and in that, like we just saw, that in that connecting with each other, we're kind of building the 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 tools and knowledge base and community base 
that we need to uh, to support greater and more accurate representation across our art. Um, so it is absolutely a process, and you really did uh, articulate that the nuances of that really, really well. Um, I just I want to add something yeah, to please. Sylvia. Um, actually, when the play was um, having its world premiere at Williamstown Festival, I reached out to the producers and let them know about my work. Obviously, they didn't share it with you, and they said that they've got the cultural part covered. So I just thought you should know that. And, and I yeah, talked, I think those are the I, conversations. I talked to many, many levels of people all the way to the artistic director. Yeah, yeah the, the work continues. We need to keep advocating, keep pushing. And I'm seeing it improve as time goes on, um, as the, a better understanding at all levels of organizations becomes uh, around the importance of representation um that is a huge part of this it's it's every part of an of a theater understanding why representation is important um and therefore making that effort to 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 go to to really understand the nuances of our cultures and and put them on stage and behind the stage as well in a legitimate way um one thing to keep yeah. in mind is that um, one of the things I've realized that the playwrights feel that responsibility, um, but when something gets produced, there are so many levels of decision making and um, budgeting and goals and um, interests that some things just do not really um, seem as important than other things, uh, and especially around cultural uh, authenticity and cultural advocacy and production. Uh, I feel like it's still kind of a new thing, even though people know they need it, but they're like, mm, um, yeah, we, we just, you know, we're not gonna do the work. And um, uh, so it's, it's really not, I feel like in many, many cases, uh, place where the playwright can influence. I mean, I've worked with playwrights in developing a whole play and they wanted me to be part of the production and then the theaters couldn't come up with the budget or like he had to go scramble. So it's it, it, it's many levels that I think has to commit to this, um, uh, you know, representation, whether it's with, you know, BIPOC, Afghan, MENA, SWANA, whatever the acronym is. Um, there, the predominantly white institutions really need to assess where they're um, going to put their efforts. I'm so glad that you brought that up. Absolutely, that it 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 absolutely needs to be on the producers to uh, to make sure that that's happening. Um, the playwright cannot, you know, they've already written an entire play about this. So it's like, and represented through that storytelling, um, that, that a lot of that, um, responsibility comes upon the folks who are making those greater decisions. Um, uh, I am wondering, uh, for all of you, you know, given current events in Afghanistan, I'm wondering how your work has shifted. Uh, Humaira, you, uh, you talked a little bit about what you are, how you've been responding, uh, creating that that video, which I know came uh, before our full withdrawal, um, but uh, and doing, of course, um, specific uh, fundraising campaigns around folks who you're trying to get out of the country. Um, I'm wondering if, if each of you can speak to if and how your work or maybe even life has shifted since um, the US started withdrawing from Afghanistan. I've been hearing so much from basically like every Afghan American that I know that they're doing work, so much work on their own time to get people out of the country, to write visas, to write letters, to send money, um, which just takes up so much time and effort. Um, and so I'd love to he hear if you're willing to share about both your work and maybe how this these current events have shifted your personal life. 
Um, and Gazelle, thank you so much for joining us. Hi, I'm so glad you're about power. I'm sorry about back. the power outage delay. <laughs> That is totally fine. Can you actually, you could jump in and if you, if you can please introduce yourself and maybe talk to start with, start this question that I know you came in the middle of um, what you're doing right now when it comes to advocacy, um, as well as what your, how your art is responding to current events, but please just also just introduce yourself. It's great to have you here. Okay. Uh, sure, my name is Gazelle Samizai. I'm a member of the Afghan American Artists and Writers Association, um, also known as AWA. And I'm also a visual artist. I work in multimedia um, and a lot of my work deals with my Afghan American identity and being a woman in both of those spaces. And um, for the last month and a half or so, AWA has been helping to evacuate several artists that we have uh, worked with in the past. Um, so it started with just, first of all, trying to get them out before that August 31st deadline, um, but then now has moved on to filing humanitarian parole applications to help hopefully um, get them out of the country. We also have a fundraiser um, to help with that as well. And, um, yeah, I think that about covers it. Is I did you also have another question? No, that's that's wonderful. Uh, we'll let you get settled um, and continue to continue. You can respond to this question kind of when you're ready to. But I was asking how folks art has shifted or changed due to current events in Afghanistan, whether both your your art, your work, but also perhaps your personal life at this time, if you're willing to share that. Um, but anyone can jump in. Sure, I would just say that uh, I feel like this whole crisis kind of engulfed my identity. And so art was just like pushed aside. And it's only I want to say in like the last week or two that um, I was kind of reminded of the value of art to like process and also um, like talk about issues related to, to Afghan identity and probably like in a year or something, I'll end up making art about all of this once I've had time to process it. Gazelle, I was going to say exactly what you just said. Um, yeah, very similar. Uh, everything was just on hold for a solid two weeks. Um, I was participating in getting my family out. Uh, I had family who were visiting from the States and then also lots of family that live in Afghanistan. A lot of them are concentrated in Kabul um, because my family is from the rural parts of Afghanistan. My family's from a region called Wardag, which is near uh, Ghazni, which um, you might hear in the news often. It's a prominent region. Um, but they've all in the last few years relocated to Kabul because it's just so dangerous. The rural areas are where the war was, was really happening, where the drone strikes were happening. You know, and my uncle's house was getting shelled every day and he had to abandon his apple orchard, which was his livelihood. Um, so I had been working, I basically had two full-time jobs for two weeks. Um, and then with the time difference, communicating with my family in Afghanistan, I was up almost every night until four or five in the morning and then getting up in a couple hours to go to work. So it was incredibly overwhelming. Um, it's not over yet. I was luckily, thank God, able to get six members of my family out. Um, but I had six others that qualified for evacuation that for some reason got turned away at the gate after their third attempt at the airport. Um, it was just kind of at the discretion of whoever was working the gate that day. And they, those family members actually have um, visa petitions because it's um, my uncle who was a US citizen, it's his wife and children um, that he had applied for a while ago. And they had their final interview scheduled at the embassy on September 13th. And of course, all of that just disappeared. So what I've been doing is I had to transfer all their paperwork to Qatar because that's where the uh, US is doing their um, operations now that there is no embassy in Kabul. Um, so that work continues for sure. And um, major shout out to CARE Washington and specifically Brianna O'Frey, who's an incredible um, attorney who was doing all this volunteer work, helping hundreds and I think even thousands of people try to evacuate. Um, so CARE was an incredible organization that did so much volunteer work um, 
And, but unfortunately, and my many calls with Brianna, you know, she let me know she was working with so many families and my family was one of the only ones that got out. And it wasn't even everyone that we were trying to get out. Um, but anyway, all of that is to say that um, art has definitely been on hold. Um, now that my family got out and we're kind of in this limbo period with the other folks we're trying to get out, I have had a, a moment to breathe. Um, I binge read like four plays because <laughs> I just needed to focus on anything else, um, which was really nice and, and reminded me that, um, you know, I, I, as difficult as this time has been that I should probably remember it. So I've been trying to like journal and, and kind of just write down whatever thoughts have been coming into my head. Um, because yeah, similar to Ghazal, I feel like this is something maybe in a year or two I want to explore more, but right now it's so fresh, um, so traumatic, so just exhausting. Uh, and I'm, you know, I'm just one of so many people in the diaspora who are helping thousands of people try to escape. And like, I have Afghans who found my website and just were sending me emails like, hi, I have this connection. Can you help me? Like, just because I'm American and there's, nothing I can do for them. And so the work definitely continues. Um, but for now it's, these moments like this really make me pause and reevaluate like, okay, what am I doing with my time? You know, like it, it's that immigrant guilt of like, oh, being an artist is like a selfish endeavor when it's not, it's so essential to my culture and being on stage and having people see people that look like me or helping other people who look like me get on stage or on screen is important. Um, but I, I do, I definitely have that survivor's guilt for sure. And it, it always makes me reevaluate, like, what am I doing? And, and kind of recommit myself to my artistic mission um, and just making sure that I'm working in equitable spaces. I'm, I'm working to amplify voices, you know, and, and not just my own. Um, yeah, scattered thoughts. It's been a crazy few weeks, but uh, conversations like this give me uh, hope and make me really grateful. Well, I'm just going to say everything Fatma said <laughs> applies to me as well. Um, I'm actually wearing a very fancy Afghan dress. This is not my normal Friday night uh, garb. Um, I'm uh, amplifying Afghan women's voices through a social media campaign um, called Don't Touch My Clothes, hashtag Don't Touch My Clothes. And basically Afghan women are going on social media in um, traditional or non-traditional Afghan attire and showcasing um, how Afghan women dress to counter um, the propaganda that Taliban are putting out there with putting out these women. I, I heard that half of them were men dressed in these Darth Vader like robes from head to toe and black gloves. It was, it was just laughable. Um, so one of the things that I have found myself um, doing is being on social media a lot. I am not a Twitter fan and I'm on Twitter all the time. The first week I was messaging, uh, using my computer, uh, being on WhatsApp that I had carpal tunnel. I mean, both my arms, like they hurt so bad. So I started using, you know, voice uh, messaging. Uh, I have not been on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook as much as I have in the past three weeks. Um, and uh, I, I feel that I have a privilege. I have the privilege to be here talking to all of you about art. While today we heard that uh, the Taliban have banned girls from um, Sorry, this is very emotional for me. Uh, um, continuing school beyond secondary school. I spent 18 years, you know, in the province of Ghazni next to Wardak, where Fatima's family is working with educators there. We have 
uh, supported girls that were, um, you know, became midwives, doctors. Actually, one of the women who was the head of Ministry of uh, Women's Affairs, which also got shut down, um, is a graduate of our schools. So this to me is really a uh, stab in the heart. And um, I would say the first couple of days, I think I cried a lot, <laughs> but then I was inundated with um, a lot of press inquiries as well as people asking for help and such. And um, you feel, uh, aside from survivor's guilt, I had tremendous amount of PTSD because my family was in Afghanistan when the Russians invaded um, and I was 11 years old. So I remember the panic and the fear that my parents had um, at that time as to like, what is going to happen to us? We can't live in this country. So seeing the people, you know, trying to leave and talk about, you know, what uh, pictures can do, you know, the uh, people trying to hold on to the airplanes and such, it was really terrible. I'm a really good sleeper and I couldn't sleep at all. So aside from all that, I would say that the one thing that really saved me along with helping our director of our school get out and, and sending some funding to our teachers because there's so much inflation right now. Um, this um, uh, action for Afghan social media campaign um, that I basically met um, uh, a graphic artist uh, who works in tech and she's like 22 or something incredibly young. Um, and she and I, you know, work really uh, close together to put this campaign together. And it's all basically very intricate messaging that she's put together into these beautiful graphics and music that we keep sharing. And I feel like that really saved me on the first week because I really got immersed into, first of all, doing something that was completely foreign to me. I, like I said, you know, social media is not my strength to put this messaging together. What is it we want to say? What is it that we want the world to know, yeah, there are the 200,000 that had to get out, but then there's 40 million people who are left behind. And what did we leave them? And what is the legacy of our country? Um, so that that has really saved me. And then, of course, um, you know, two weeks into it, I got the good news of being accepted for this residency. So that's been wonderful. But I have to say, like, my brain is completely clogged and I can't write. I'm hoping that it'll come back. Um, but I can see how uh, cultures can dis get destroyed during war, because if you are in this kind of situation where you're in this flight and, uh, fight and flight mode, you're in the survival mode, um, how can you create? How can you think in a creative way? How can you see the joys and beauty of life that you could express in your art? Um, and that is one of the things that really scares me about the future of Afghanistan and what will happen to the artists. So uh, I'm really happy to hear that Gazelle's uh, uh, organizations getting people out, but then there will be musicians that are left behind, you know, um, uh, all, all, all kind, you know, visual artists, writers, and, and that makes me very, very sad. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. You really have um, kind of articulated uh, some of 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 that feeling of overwhelm that this uh, that cur the current events news right now is, and I, as a non Afghan, I feel overwhelmed, and so I can't imagine how you all are feeling as well. Um, you know, you each have kind of shared. Uh, specific ways that folks can support right now. Uh, and we'll share out those those links and everything um, that you've been mentioning throughout this uh, conversation. Um, but also, as you said, Humaira, that as people leave um, and as the, uh, you know, re current regime, everything kind of settles in and it starts to inevitably, uh, as it kind of heartbreakingly does, leave the news and leave the the you know the front of our you know of what we're seeing um 
there are still people that will be there left in Afghanistan. There will still be artists there. There will still be women and girls uh, living there and needing support. Um, and so I wonder how can non-Afghans or folks in the United States um, uh, support Afghan, Afghan people in an ongoing way? Uh, how, what should we be keeping in mind or, or committing to now that can continue that support after it be after it starts to um, fade from you know the the front page of the newspaper, which it inevitably will, uh, which is again always just heartbreaking because it never fades from the front page of our lives. Um, but what can we do now? What can we commit to now that will be an ongoing support? I think it's just always first and foremost so important to, you know, amplify Afghan voices. Um, there we have so many experts in our community in the diaspora and in Afghanistan and, and other places that are, you know, professors, historians, scholars, um, artists. There are so many people, activists who are working on the ground, working to get people out, working to assist people. And I've met uh, so many folks who I, I believe they have nothing but good intentions in their heart, um, who are American or, you know, especially white, who set up these organizations or donations or something to assist. And they, they have like these really great intentions, but they're, it's always about saving Afghan women instead of supporting Afghan women or supporting Afghan orphans or, you know, supporting Afghan people. And I think we really need to let go of that like colonial white savior mindset and really direct that energy towards the Afghans who are doing the work um, on the ground. Cause there are so many of them, you know, you don't have to look far to find someone who is truly an expert and doing some really incredible work. Um, so, I, I mean, that's just always kind of what I go to first is just finding those Afghan voices and supporting them and supporting the work that they do. Um, I will add that I think that when I think about what Americans can do, I think very much about how they can influence American policy and American conceptions of Afghanistan. And I think Fatima's suggestion of listening to the voices there is very important in, in understanding the complexity of what's going on there. Um, I also think at least in the context of this immigration crisis, um, you know, American citizens can be pressuring their representatives to change the laws around immigration. For example, with the humanitarian parole and a lot of the visa applications, they expect Afghans to go to a third country before their paperwork can be processed. So imagine you're in a country where all the borders are closed. You don't have money because you're not being paid anymore. And you can't leave the country without a visa. And yet you're being told in order to get a visa, you have to leave. It's like completely insane. So I know like some, some of the lawyers that I've been working with, with the humanitarian parole, they're trying to like, you know, pressure US senators to change that rule because it's completely in my mind, inhumane. Um, I think a second thing that American citizens can do um, is to really be mindful of kind of the rhetoric that's being shared about like what it is to be Afghan or Muslim. For example, someone on Twitter in Missoula, Montana said, oh, 74 Afghans are coming and they're not welcome here. You know, there's a lot of people who are gonna be coming in and we already saw a lot of, um, you know, anti-Muslim, anti-Afghan, et cetera, um, sentiment after 9-11 and you know there's there could be another backlash again so I think um, you know to Fatma's point of, of understanding like the complexity of stories we just like those who are interested in helping need to continue to like keep the conversation alive and like educate their fellow friends on on these people and like humanizing them in their situation. 
Not to speak twice, but I just want to add to what Hazel said, because it's really important, specifically with that humanitarian parole, one of the biggest things in addition to um, having them change the rules about going to a third party country, because this is exactly the problem that my family is in right now, where they're somehow have to get to Qatar, don't know how that's going to happen, but also the Ameri the US government created this problem of refugees and is now charging each individual refugee refugee $575 to apply for humanitarian parole per person $575. Um, so there's also an effort to pressure representatives to waive that fee as well, um, which is really, really important. So that's another um, cause that you can get politically active for in your local community and pressure your representatives to do something about that because it is completely inhumane as well. Um, I can jump in uh, on my website, hamiragilzai.com. I have a section called Action for Afghans and it has uh, I have around like 15 um, easy things that you can do uh, whether it's to contact your representatives or to volunteer uh, to welcome refugees, to update Afghan voices, and uh, and I keep updating that with more information as it comes. So that's one way to engage short term. But I also think that the Americans have the right to know why was the U.S. in Afghanistan what happened in all these years and why did our government lie to us? And now I'm talking from an American perspective. I am an American who um, lives in, and there's currently a book that's just published called Afghan Papers. I think it should be reading material for every single uh, person in the United States over the age of 35. So you can better understand how we go in other countries and we topple their governments and we change things up and we push our own agenda. And then when it's time to leave, we just dump them and move on to the next place. And then once again, we do the same thing. And this has got to be stopped. We need to move as a country from an economy of war to an economy of support doing good in the world, you know, saving the planet. And unfortunately, this is something that is very hidden in plain sight to be to I mean, you don't have to dig very far to actually get to this point. If you look at who benefited out of the two and a half billion dollars um, that the US spent on Afghanistan, it's six major US government and the military contractors who benefited the most. So this is something that is seems complex, but it isn't. And I'm really tired of Afghan politicians, uh, sorry, American politicians shifting the blame on the Afghans saying there's corruption and infighting. Yes, those things are true. But there's a lot of corruption and fighting in our country as well. And what we do is export a lot of that into other countries and we destroy their systems and we make promises and then we don't deliver. And to me, we have got to stop this because this is not a sustainable way for our economy to thrive or our people to thrive because war is basically a cancer that's within the the uh, uh, on earth and it's going to eventually affect all of us um so if if you were to really be interested in engaging with afghanistan first we need to understand what the culpability of our country our politicians and i'm talking about george bush president obama uh trump and joe biden they're all involved in this um so it's not uh Republicans slash Dem or or Democrat. So um, get a copy of Afghanistan papers. Please read that. <laughs> That's going to give you a shocking insight as to what a mess we have made in Afghanistan. We could have gotten out of there within five years, but we didn't. And it's not because the Afghans asked us to stay.
real quick while we're still on the subject of things people can do and good things to know um you know we're talking a lot about afghan women as you know three of us are afghan women um and the u.s has really um used and weaponized afghan women um in their mission and in going into afghanistan saying that you know they need to save us or that our rights are being violated um and you know while that was occurring under the Taliban rule for sure. Um, I just really want people to make this distinction or to note when talking about Afghan women, when supporting incoming refugees, um, to really pause and ask yourself if what you're about to say or what you're about to write on your protest sign is Islamophobic, um, because that is rhetoric that has really been um, poisoning the dialogue around Afghan women, you know, certainly I 100% I agree that nobody, no government, no group should ever um, enforce rules upon what women can do, how they can move, how they can operate, and especially what they can wear. But it is important to remember that some women choose to wear burqas, some women choose to wear abayas, Afghan and elsewhere. Um, so I just really hope that people take that into consideration when talking about Afghan women and um, it, when they are you know, wanting to do something to support us uh, is leaving the Islamophobia at the door because that is a problem in, um, in the West, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Everyone has shared so much, so much that's so powerful, um, you know, uh, I think you a lot of what y'all brought brought up bring me back to that importance of arts and humanities um, in regards to humanizing in regards to sharing a uh, a variety of perspectives um, and art being not only theater of course but also writing to check out the uh, Afghan American Writers Association uh, to find um, you know videos or. Uh, writing or testimonials from Afghan women, Afghan people in Afghanistan that can sh that can better inform advocates as to how to advocate, how to change culture, uh, how to change their own opinions, and how to best support. Um, and I love that you bring up culture change, um, Humaira, as well, both political culture change, but also across uh, the United States and across the world when it comes to what our priorities are and how we um, welcome uh, other cultures. Um, this is all, you know, incredibly important. Um, and so I hope that that helps for, for for attendees to better shape how they're advocating and, and kind of take this overwhelming situation and begin to approach it again through those personal stories and through better understanding, um, understanding the culture, understanding current events, understanding our history and each person's personal, you know, role in, especially as Americans in this history. Um, I would love to end, we only have a couple minutes, but I would love to end um, on your, you know, a, a I guess a, a glimmer of hope or a glimmer of joy, um, asking you, each what you love about Afghan art and what parts of your own culture inspire you. I, I can say it. Um, one thing I, I love so much about Afghan art and our culture in general is um, the use of poetry and wordplay. Um, just in a conversation with my mom. I, I can't have a conversation with my mom without a proverb or three being slipped in. Um, and I love that, that that's just built into our language that we we speak in this really poetic, in both Pashto and Farsi. Um, that's something that's really important to me. And also the uh, oral storytelling. Um, that's another thing that I'm, I'm really trying to like focus my um, artistic mind towards because my mom and you know my grandparents they are the best storytellers I know it's such a big part of our culture like my aunt told me that when she was a kid my mom was their television they would sit around her after dinner and she would tell these epic tales like equivalent to like Lord of the Rings where it would take her months to tell a whole story every night and there were songs and all of this stuff added to it and that I 
you know, she's forgotten so much of that just because the trauma that she experienced during the Soviets and immigrating here, you know, her brain could only hold so much. And, and I, I'm really, I really want to find that again. I really want to recapture that. I want to try and document those stories and create new ones and um, really lean into that tradition of poetic oral storytelling. So that's one thing I love about Afghan culture and art. I'll jump in. Um, I love Afghan carpets. They're gorgeous. Um, and I have some of them at home and I really love walking on them, looking at them. But my real love of Afghan culture is Afghan food. Uh, of course, I write about Afghan food on my blog, Afghan Culture Unveiled. Um, but I don't think you can really understand the essence of people uh, without eating the food. And that's one of the things, any production I've worked on, I'm like, we got to go eat some Afghan food. These artists have to absorb Afghan culture through their stomach. So um, yeah, so I hope you all get to either support an Afghan restaurant or cook some Afghan food at home with my recipes or, or whatever. Um, yeah, and I'll add that um... I'm really drawn to embroidery work um, in textiles in Afghan culture. And another glimmer of hope is that I think that we're in an unprecedented time of activism and organizing in the Afghan American community and also non-Afghan Americans organizing um, on behalf of Afghans. And I think that that's really powerful. And I hope that we can you know, continue that momentum um, to create more, more change and better policies in the future. Nebra, you're muted. Okay, hello. Okay, am I mute? Okay, great. Sorry. Um, uh, it's been, I'm just so incredible, uh, incredibly thankful that you all take the time to be here, um, to share your own stories, to share your work with us, uh, to share your advocacy. We'll make sure to uh, get that information, those links and everything out to folks. Um, and, uh, and we'll be looking out for your for your stories. Uh, Humaira and Fatima will be looking out for these uh, these stories that you shared with this the world today um, that should definitely be out there um, to share a different perspective. Um, and I'm just so, so, so grateful um, and pleased to everyone who's watching. As we've said, you know, as Gazelle really in a lovely way kind of ended us with that this is an unprecedented time for advocacy for Afghanistan um, and let's never let that end let that you know establish now that kind of advocacy that can sustain uh, for each and every person watching here uh, find that way that you can sustain that for yourself um, and thank you all so so much for joining us have a lovely evening thank you so much thank you thank you Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>